administrative meetings in our church council. Church council will be at 7.30, so I invite you to come then so we can vote on any additional things to our calendar or our budget. Um, soup lunch is coming up. We're gonna reignite this ministry. Uh, it's the first Monday of each month. It's gonna be in October. Jeanette C is organizing this for us. If you can make us, even if you can't be here, if you can make a soup or something, uh, I know she would love the help um, it, this is a ministry where we just say, any and all, come, have a, have a bowl of soup together in our fellowship hall on that day once a month. Uh, so that's a wonderful ministry. Then the last one I want to call to your attention is not on your flyer. We'll make sure it's in next week, but let me tell you before that. Um, I just heard about on October 6th, the Atlantic Highlands um, Equity and Inclusion uh, Group, uh, started with a group of parents that came together, um, is showing a, move, a, a documentary down in the movie house, and it's called A White Man Walks Into a Barber Shop. And afterwards, uh, there's gonna be a discussion. So I invite you to take a look. If you need a link or anything, I, I forget how much the tickets are, but it, it just $10, I'm getting the word that they're $10, 
Um, I just think this will be a very interesting time for our community to come together and, and be in some conversation. Uh, we've been pushing for these kinds of opportunities, so it is great to see. Uh, so October 6th, mark your calendar if you're able. Those are the announcements I want to share, but I know that we have prayers. I first want to invite us to pray for Barbara Fowler. Um, Barbara, if you're watching us online, we are holding you in our deepest prayers. Um, Barbara took a fall and has some injuries that are, have her in rehab right now. Uh, we'll probably take her to surgery eventually, um, but please, 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 let's keep Barbara in our prayer. She is just, she was going to greet you this morning, and she can't do that because of these injuries So uh, in, our, in our Northex. So please keep Barbara in your prayers. I know we also keep um, Terry's brother Roy in our prayers. Uh, so we hold him in our prayers and you as you minister with them. Are there other prayers that you want to name this morning? Kevin. Your grandmother and your grandfather. Nico, your friend. I'm sorry. I, I miss Nico and I got your grandmother. So we're going to pray for both Nico and your grandmother. Thank you, Kevin, for sharing that. Julie. So we got Judith, and what was the first name of the second person? Judith and Marsha. Judith and Marsha. So we keep both of them in our prayers, Julie. Thank you. Others? Then we come together and we feel the presence of God. We wish all those online, um, may the peace of God be with you. Let us stand and greet each other with signs of peace and love. Peace be. to worship responsibly. In this time of worship and joyful praise, may we also be silent, still, and aware as love meets our struggles. In our hearts, the Spirit is present. Listen and learn. Be open and find.
This morning, our centering prayer is inactive rather than responsive. So settle into a comfortable position, an attitude of prayer, and I will lead you. The Apostle Paul tells us that God prays for us with sighs too deep for words, and the life-giving breath of God gives us all we need. So let us breathe deeply, inhaling the good gifts that God provides and exhaling all the things that we need to release. Let us breathe in strength. Let us exhale our exhaustion. Let us breathe in a new sense of direction. Let us exhale the paths we no longer want to use. Let us breathe in hope. Let us exhale self-doubt. Let us breathe in unconditional love. Let us exhale all that holds us back. Now let us pray together. Holy Spirit, fill us with your love that we may sing with joy. Take away fears and worries that we might see a new way forward filled with your goodness. Amen. It's kind of hard to imagine. 
this is bad, I'm going to put all of that on you. God says, all the things that are going on, I'm going to put that together. And then all of a sudden, be fine. Even through some of the challenges. Does that make sense? A little bit? So I'm going to invite us to pray together as a family of God to remind us that all of us, that sometimes, even through the challenges, we need to be aware and know that God's going to help us get to something good. But sometimes we just got to get through it, knowing that there are people around us who help us know God's love. Okay? So I'm going to invite us to pray together. And I say a line, and then I say, I invite you all to say that line after me. So we are praying as one family, supporting, encouraging, and loving one another with God's love. So let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, Dear God thank you for being part of our lives. Thank you for being part of our lives. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who shows us your love. Who shows us your love. Help us to know. Help us to know that you are working, that you are working together with us, together with us, and to all the parts of our lives, and all the parts of our lives to make something good, to make something good of our lives, of our lives. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks, you guys. Let us now set our Epistle lesson this morning, we turn to Paul's letter to the Church of Rome. Hear now these words from Roman chapter 8, verses 18 to 28. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be free from its enslavement to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers together the pains of labor, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the fr first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is, not, that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what one already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes, intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And God, who searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. May God bless our reading, hearing, and understanding. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Very present God, may your spirit open our ears to hear, our minds to learn, and our hearts to meditate on your teaching this morning. And know the words of my mouth, that all which is shared may be your message for us, your disciples. Amen. Amen. Has anyone ever said to you, or maybe you said it to someone else, everything happens for a reason? Maybe in a situation 
when you're lost for words and there's this heavy silence sitting there between you. A common cliche or phrase that we are prone to use in those awkward moments. Filling the deafening silence with something that sounds almost scriptural, if you will. True and maybe even wise. Phrases like, God will never give you more than you can handle. Or God helps those who help themselves. Or what goes around comes around. This is where we begin our five-week sermon series entitled, The Bible Never Said That. Examining phrases, if you will, that may sound so wise and so true that you might even believe that it's a Christian thing to say. Words when you're in moments of mystery and anxiety, where the unanswerable questions are in front of us. So we tend to manufacture answers quickly, right? Because life wants us to fill time constantly. Heaven forbid we have silence. Those moments when we are eager to resolve the dissonance between our hopes and our beliefs. With realities and paradoxes of our real world. Times when we are quick to try to settle the dust and resolve our anxieties. Ever felt that? While some of these answers might sound vaguely scriptural, they are often conflicting with the true character, nature, and will of God. Maybe you've heard it said, forgive and forget. Or God is in complete control over everything. Or our phrase today, everything happens for a reason. Let me first say, the Bible never said that. That said, what scripture does say which we heard today from the Apostle Paul in our reading from Romans, all things work together for good for those who love God. What we are wrestling with in, this, in these two statements is human freedom. Does God have some predetermined plan that's already mapped out for each and every one of our lives, for the world? Is our life somewhat inevitable, in which we know that our lives are in complete control by God? Does God have God's hands all over everything in every moment of our lives? Those are the questions. Occasionally, someone will say to me, it's all worked out according to God's plan. Maybe they're in the midst of a crisis or a crossroads. Maybe you've had that in your life or are facing that now. You're having to make a difficult decision. <clears throat> they want some assurance that life is not random. That this decision is going to lead somewhere. That it's mapped out already. Perhaps on God's time. So they want to believe that God has a plan. Or maybe they have no idea what to do next. I've been there, have you? Don't know what we're going to do next. What turn to take, what step to make next in their lives. And they want some assurance that whatever they are doing is going to be okay. So let's put it all in God's hands. They might say everything has a purpose and a reason. Maybe during a very hard time or difficult season in their life, at some personal setback, tragedy, disappointment, they are simply trying to make sense of it and give that answer. 
and it may not only be in the challenges, maybe they've experienced a windfall in life, something they never expected, and so they say, everything does have a reason. What in your life has felt random? So that you, you're out of control and you want to believe there is a reason. There is a map we follow. We can't turn to the back of a book to get the answers or to find out how the story will end in our lives, can we? It is in the unknowing. It's when it feels like decisions about your life have been made for you that we point to God. This is how we make sense of wonderful things in life and the terrible things in life. Theologians have a name for this, and it's called cosmology a term that tries to describe how we understand our world, how we see the forces in the world, nature and God working all together. In other words, we make sense of difficult things that we go through or inexplicable things like losing the job or why a relationship didn't work out or why the marriage broke up. At face value, we can say everything happens for a reason. And you would be, frac well, a little factually true and correct. We live in a world of cause and effect, am I right? Actions produce consequences. Choices lead often to very particular outcomes. Texting while driving, a big one since someone's learning to drive in our household, will increase substantially the likelihood of you getting in a car accident. Smoking will increase substantially the chances of getting lung cancer. Skydiving without a parachute has a particular inevitable consequence. Am I right? We laugh, but right? If that parachute doesn't open. Yet sometimes cause and effect do not fit. When people perish in Puerto Rico due to yet another hurricane, when a child in a stroller is randomly shot as he and his mother are going to a local bodega just to get milk, when a teen goes into hospice because of leukemia, when a single mother of two gets laid off in a corporate restructure and suddenly finds themselves homeless, when a beloved father dies of a sudden brain aneurysm, we have, my friends, these unexplainable, inexplicable, undeserving sufferings in life. These life and death outcomes for which we are, are never any good or justifiable reasons. We often seek consolation in the face of these mysteries. We do that by saying that God has a purpose for causing, at least allowing, these things to happen. When we do not understand why these things happen, our minds point to something predetermined. That God will make sense of them since God is in charge of everything. But my friends, to say everything happens for a reason is simply to absolve ourselves from our own human responsibility our own human freedom with the choices and the inactions that we make or do not make. Not everything happens or has to happen or should happen. Not every one of us here is always making mistakes. Sometimes we hurt people 
with things that we say and we later wish we didn't say. Am I right? I know I do. Sometimes we do things that we wish we didn't. Sometimes we turn a blind eye to injustice or we're totally oblivious because we're in our own world and don't realize what's going on around us. Sometimes we squander extraordinary opportunities. Sometimes we act with intentionality and sometimes more often we act unintentionally. But never are they part of God's intention. Hear that clear? Never are they God's intention. There is no divine, immutable plan for which sin and injustice are ever justified. God does not predetermine these things to happen in order to accomplish some divine purpose. To say that everything happens for a reason is to absolve ourselves from our own human freedom to make right choices, decisions, and actions. And it makes God responsible for absolutely everything that happens in the world. Every expression of genuine evil and every natural disaster. These curiously acts of God, as some people will call them, create a theology that keeps people from believing in God altogether. I have a hard time believing, my friends that God would make injustice, sufferings, or tragedy as a necessary part of the cosmic plan. How about you? Is that your God? It's not mine. The words of the Apostle Paul in today's passage describes a God who is completely different from that kind of God. He tells us that our God is generous and expansive. Our God doesn't absolve us from our own human responsibility to make good decisions. Our God gets involved, yes, and participates in creation. Our God doesn't just create at the beginning of the time and sit back. No, our God is in every moment in every occasion, in everything in life, but working together with us to make good even in the midst of suffering, injustice, and tragedy. Our God is creating every day so that Paul's words become true. For all things work together for good. Paul is saying that in everything that happens, in every occasion, in every moment, in every event, God is constantly working with the raw material of your life. Mining it, gleaning from it, pulling from all that is and remains to be good in order to stitch it together and continue to write the story of each of our lives. This God, my God, our God, is responsible for participating with us in writing our own stories as a God who loves us, a lover God, not a dictator. As implied with the words, everything happens for a reason. Theologian and writer Richard Rohr says it this way, to genuinely know God is to meet a lover, not a dictator. At the heart of that phrase, everything happens for a reason, is this deep human hope that God has a plan for us. And I would suggest that we change the word plan to purpose. Some theologians say that God has an initial aim in each of our lives, for all of our lives. And it is 
this hoped for at outcome that Paul says, it is that you flourish as children of God. Jeremiah 29, many of us have used that, we used it right after Sandy a lot. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans of peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. Change the word plans. I know I ha the purpose I have for you, says the Lord. They are, there is a purpose for peace, not disaster, to give you a future of hope. See the difference? One rabbi's interpretation says it this way, and I love this. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I have something in mind for you, says God. Some hope for the future and purpose for your life. Paul says that this purpose is to set free creation from the bondage of decay we may obtain. So we may obtain the freedom of the glory that shall be children of God's. This is God's highest purpose for you, my friends, for all of us. God's initial aim that you would be fully liberated from everything that binds you. Suffering, sin, injustice, any kind of addiction, anxiety, anger, regrets. God's aim for us all is to flourish as children of God. Friends, we are not puppets on a string. God can't and doesn't choose to control our journey that we take. Because again, God is not a dictator. God is a lover. Or as process theologians describe, God's activity is not coerced, but persuasion. Meaning that God is here saying, hey you, I've got something in mind for you over here, and you're over there. God is working in our lives as a lure, pulling us, not pushing us pulling us to God's initial aim. I think this is the, the, the best illustration to fully get our minds around it is our most intimate relationships, a spouse, a child, a sibling, or a friend. A relationship with a love that is never coerced or manipulated. And even though we might often fall, we know that true love means exactly the opposite of control. True love means letting go. Sorry, at just the right time. It means voluntarily relinquishing our control. It means granting the other some sense of autonomy and freedom. This is the nature of God's love, my friends. We say that God is powerful, but God expresses God's power through love. I know when my daughters were placed in my arms, my heart exploded. And I remember thinking I fully understood love until those moments. I love them more than myself. I love them more than life. I also know that when my children hurt, my heart hurts. So we do everything we can as parents, at least I have, to create an environment and rules that they might thrive, right? Some work, some don't. Look both ways before crossing the street. Wear your sunscreen, eat your broccoli, right? All intended for good. That said, there are those moments when we must let go and let them function as responsible free adults. I was reminded of this yesterday when my youngest went to a f her first college open house. And my oldest daughter is now learning adulting in her first job and apartment post-college graduation. Those moments when we let go of control and realize that your child is exposed to the risks of life. Moments like reaching into your pocket and pulling out keys and allowing them to drive. God is the purest form of love, my friends. 
a love that allows others to be truly free, a love so powerful, it is willing, God is willing to give up control, not by coercion or overriding our human responsibilities, but through per persuasive love. God's love helps us to get through the dark times. We know God's love. We know with God's love, not everything happens for a reason. But that in the midst of all things, God is working for good. If you need reassurance, look back in your life. Look at the things that have happened. Connect the dots, see the patterns emerge, and get a glimpse of the bigger picture than the one you're in in the moment. In the present, we can't see outcomes. But when we look back with great clarity, when we look back, we begin to see who we are today and how we got here. When we look back, we often are often heard saying, I didn't get it back then. But some things actually worked out for the best. We gain perspective when we look back, and we may see God moments that are all stitched together. No, everything doesn't happen for a reason. But it is absolutely no accident that you are here in this space, in this moment of your life, in this moment of time, it is no coincidence because all along, as Paul says, God has been gleaning, mining, and working with the raw material of your life to stitch it all together and make something good. Will you pray with me? Spirit of life, as we enter this sacred time of prayer, we breathe deep knowing your love and grace abound, knowing your life-giving abundance is present in the air around us, in the food and water that sustain us, in the care and support we see, receive from family, friends, and the community that surround us, even this morning. We are so very aware of the deep concerns in our world this morning, the ongoing war in Ukraine, the devastation in Puerto Rico and other lands due to hurricanes and flooding, illnesses, grief, loneliness, heartache, it overwhelms us, God. We wonder where do we even start to pray? And we don't always know how to pray. Yet we do have assurance that you will join us when the heartache is too deep for words in our shared grief and shared understanding, in our sorrows and our delights. So Lord, hear the prayers of your children as we share them. Okay. We are confident in your unending desire for connection with us. With this assurance, we join together in one voice to pray along with our siblings in Christ around the world. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers come forward, I invite our Sunday school children and our teachers to make their way upstairs to greet others that may be coming. And now let us give our gifts to God that we may continue to express a ministry of hope for all God's children.
Christ Jesus, God's only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. to those who live in need and long for our care. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn of dedication. Uh, when we are called to sing, intentional prayer since this is all new things I'm going to remind you of them if you'd like intentional prayer we invite you to come into the sanctuary and be praying for our children our church and our world as we go out may we always know that life brings the ups the downs the challenges but God our God who loves us is not a God that dictates or a puppeteer but a God that journeys with us and invites us into thoughts, actions that bring about the good that can come of all of life. Amen. Jesus, we